All right, video works. Does audio work? Cool, audio works. How's everybody doing? We're doing good. Thank you, Shane, for coming on tonight. Yeah, no, I'm so excited about this. I love talking about MOs. Um, MOs are always fun, MOs and SDs and all that fun stuff. So I've got a PowerPoint. I don't know if that's helpful or if you just want me to run through my content and just chat if that helps or however you want to do that. Well, we are going to record this for others. Um, we've got some people from Europe here who've stayed up pretty late to attend. So I was going to say. Shout out to that. Um, but yeah, we have a couple Californians that can't attend. So whatever, however you want to do it. I think presentation slides wise, I think that's a good. And then yeah. after we can kind of have a conversation. Yeah, we can do that. That, that totally works. So I'll try not to um, take up too much time. So, uh, and there'll be some questions built in. So if you have questions, ask. Um, I'm totally fine with that. So if you need to stop me at any point in time, but hopefully um, everything will speak for itself, ideally. So you don't have to hear me talk too much. All right, let's see. Okay, so I'll make sure, Lindsay, too, that you get the PowerPoint for everybody and all that fun. <laughs> yeah, let's hash it out, right? We'll, we'll take up all the time we need. It'll be good. I promise you, like, when we get into it, it's gonna, you're going to be like, oh, like, uh, I've learned that, like, um, it's pretty straightforward when you get into EOs and AOs and all that stuff. So it's just a matter of, like, practicing it more than anything. So I think it should be good. So um, am I able to share my screen? Is that cool? I can. Patrick, right. <laughs> I'm here. I, I did the multiple people can share. Couldn't co-host Tim too since you're already the co-host. So, but we're in good shape. All right, cool. I'm not tech savvy. <laughs> That's listen. I'm not either. So I've had to learn how to be more tech savvy lately. So it's a whole thing. Yeah, Shruti, I'm told. I'm totally stoked to be here. So I'm glad I was made, able to make it work. So because I have a lot of stuff to cover, um, I'm gonna just dive in. Is everybody cool with that? Let's do it. Okay, cool. If you catch me looking over to this screen, it's because I have a second screen. So I'm probably going to just check and see how everybody's doing. Um, and I have a, my chat over here too. So I'll be able to see kind of if you have questions. So if you need me to stop, just stop me. Um, this is going to be kind of a crash course in this stuff. And I'm going to try to give like as, as much information as I can in as short amount of time as possible. Hopefully you find it helpful. So uh, to kind of start, um, when we get into this, I want you to focus on these terms. I want you to focus on function altering, value altering, behavior altering, establishing versus abolishing, evocative versus abative, and value versus availability. Because those are the terms that we're going to spend the most time differentiating, and we're going to make sure that we are really clear on what each of those means, so that when you go to identify things like MOs or SDs, that you can identify very clearly um, what they do and what they, you know, what they're responsible for and how they influence behavior. So. As part of this, we do know that SDs and MOs are both antecedents in this four-term contingency. It's usually a combination of SDs and MOs that influence behavior and produce the reinforcer or punisher, right? So we're going to focus on these two things, SDs, SDPs, MOs, all that fun stuff. Discriminative stimuli, motivating operations, those are the primary goals tonight. Uh, repertoire altering, same as false. Repertoire altering would be more like behavior altering or um, dimension altering because you're talking about the change in, a, in, a, in some type of response or, or the addition of a behavior in that repertoire. Um, yeah, so uh, let's go ahead and get into it. EOs versus SDs. When we talk about these, the two questions that you have to ask is, is the reinforcer available or is the reinforcer more valuable in that moment? Okay, is it available or valuable? Because just because it's available doesn't mean it's valuable. Just because it's valuable does not mean it's available. Okay, and so that's how you're going to start discriminating the two between SDs and MOs, okay? Uh, between discriminative stimuli and, and motivating operations specifically. Uh, yes, Penny, the presentation will be shared. I'll make sure Lindsay gets a copy and you'll, you all have like the PowerPoint and it's got some really cool um, tips and tricks in it. So let's start with the terms evocative and abative because discriminative stimuli and motivating operations do the same thing. We talk about the term evocative. We're talking about evocative effects. Um, oh, you're so kind. Thank you so much. We talk about evocative effects. We're talking about a momentary increase in the frequency of behavior, and this can be produced by a number of things. They are momentary changes, though. And what we're talking about is we're talking about a and the the 
the, the response increasing or it evokes in that moment. Abative is a behavior or altering or dimension altering effect that we talk about when it's a momentary decrease in the frequency. So if a behavior is evoked, it's, it increases. If a behavior is abated, it decreases. Now, SDs do this, right? Discriminative stimuli do these things. A signal for punishment will produce, will abate behavior. A signal for reinforcement will evoke behavior. And we're talking about MOs too. MOs, like if something is of really effective or really valuable, it's going to evoke behavior. If something, uh, as, as a reinforcer is valuable, it's going to evoke behavior. Um, if a, a punisher is valuable, it's going to abate behavior. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But evoke means increase, abative means decrease. And we're gonna, that's the behavior altering or dimension altering or repertoire altering effects that we're going to talk about today. Now, Stimuli, antecedents also have function altering effects, which means that the reinforcer or punisher or the consequence alters what that antecedent means, right? So when we're born and we're babies, we go out there, we don't have a, uh, any sort of semblance of what a hot donut sign means, right? But when I get that hot donut, in relation to that hot donut sign, all of a sudden there's a function altering effect. That hot donut sign changes, right? A bottle changes once you learn that there's cool consequences with it, right? Um, if you get alcohol poisoning, then there's a bottle of fireball somewhere that's going to be like, that's going to have an abative effect. That's going to change in function, right? We don't care about it until we get alcohol poisoning. We're like, okay, we're done until we're too hung over to see that again, right? So when you start looking at function altering consequences, whether they're reinforcing or punishing, they do alter what that antecedent means. It changes the function. It changes the purpose. And a new functional relation is created. And that's where discriminative stimuli start to come in. Discriminative stimuli are a result of a new functional relation as a result of reinforcement or punishment histories. So uh, consequences though, when you talk about function altering effects for consequences, they help create that new functional relation. So when a reinforcement occurs in the presence of a stimulus, that stimulus takes that new uh, property, those reinforcing properties, and they begin to signal availability. But uh, what ends up happening is that consequence alters the function, it changes the function, it changes the purpose, it transforms it. So now you've got consequences that have this function altering effect and you start seeing those changes. Same thing with punishment. You start seeing like, I don't know, Nickelback on the radio. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm going to turn off the radio, right? Like that's a punishing effect. Like you like all of a sudden the, the words Nickelback have a punishing effect and you do start changing the radio more often. I'm just kidding if you like Nickelback. That's just a, an ongoing joke that I make whenever I talk about punishers. Now, so now we know that learning history influences these things, but also we have to talk about availability and unavailability. Availability talks about in the past, consequences are likely to be delivered in the presence or under similar conditions. So that just means that when I'm in a space and I see certain stimuli, that means that reinforcers are available. When I go to a restaurant and it says open on the door, that means that reinforcers are available, right? Punishers are available for places that say high voltage, don't touch this fence, it's it's gonna shock you, right? Or the red, the, the red stove top, right? You see that red stove top and you're like, that signals that punishment is available, right? I know that it's available if I touch it. So that's all about availability. That, that consequence is going to happen um, in the presence of that condition. Now, unavailability is exactly the opposite, right? In the past, the consequences were not likely to occur following similar conditions. So what you see here is that unavailability means that you're not gonna contact that reinforcer. You're not gonna get reinforcement. That's the soda machine that's off, right? When that soda machine is unplugged and it's not lit up, that means that soda is not available, right? So that's all that means. You're not gonna go up to an unplugged, unlit soda machine and try to put your money in because historically, you have not gotten anything out of it. The, the reinforcers are unavailable. Breakfast, yeah, exactly. When you go to McDonald's, and well, now they changed it, right? So now it's like the menu is like almost all entirely available. But if you go to Taco Bell, Fiesta potatoes aren't available anymore. So that's a whole thing, right? It used to be, it used to signal availability, but now Fiesta potatoes are gone. So now it signals unavailability, right? So availability and unavailability. All it talks about is, is that consequence available in that moment? That's all we're focused on here. Yeah. If you want a Coke, you happen to press Fanta. Yeah, exactly. There you go. If you want a Coke, but you happen to press Fanta, then that means that you're not getting that reinforcer, right? There's going to be a different learning history related to that. You're probably less likely to engage in that Fanta pressing behavior. Uh, well, Fanta doesn't necessarily become an SD, right? Because it's not necessarily that that's the reinforcer, right? So it, it might be a reinforcer somewhere, but maybe not in that moment. And we'll, and we'll get into kind of how to discriminate that a little bit. So it might be that it's available but it might not be that it's valuable. Like, so you might prefer a Coke. The Coke is more valuable in that moment. So you have an EO for a Coke, but the SD is there for a different soda. So it, it really depends on kind of learning history and stuff like that. But we'll get, we'll get heavy into that in a second. Now, when we talk about discriminative control, 
we talk about those, those things that signal, right? Things that signal reinforcers, things that signal punishers, things that signal, um, uh, uh, you know, extinction or recovery from punishment, whatever it is. But a topography in the presence of a specific stimulus is going to contact that reinforcer, but not reinforce the other. So that's the difference between like a teacher and a substitute, right? You start discriminating when you can engage in problem behavior, right? I get in trouble with the substitute because I'm allowed to do more because they don't have the same learning history, but the teacher has more stimulus control. Right. Have, it, have you all worked in the field and gone to work with a learner and like maybe you walk into the classroom and you have really good stimulus control and the teacher's like, how do you do that? Um, like, you know, or like you have a paraprofessional, it's like, I don't, you must be magic. How do you, how do I get that magic wand? That's because you have stimulus control. Yeah, we're magic. Absolutely. Because we have stimulus control over particular behaviors. And, and that's, that's instructional control. Absolutely. Discriminative stimulus control is instructional control. Absolutely. It's just another term for it. Yeah. And pairing as a result of that. Uh, it's just the same. It's just, it's just, uh, what is that? What's that? Um, the death cat for cutie song, different names for the same thing. That's all it is. Yeah. AKA. Yeah, exactly. So discriminative control, discriminative stimulus control, instructional control, all that stuff is, is the same thing. Basically you have, you have stimulus control or instructional control over a particular set of behaviors. Yeah. Now, uh, when we talk about discriminative stimuli, we're talking about antecedent stimulus. Okay. And there's, and there's, there's, one of two types we talked about. We talked about stim, uh, discriminative stimulus. We talked about motivating operations. We're going to focus on discriminative stimuli or SDs right now. Now, discriminative stimuli can either evoke or abate responses. They have that specific behavior altering or dimension altering effect. They can do one or the other. They can evoke or increase behavior or they can decrease behavior. Now, this is re a result of history of reinforcement. So, your favorite restaurant is a descriptive stimulus because you, you see that and it means that good food is available and a history of reinforcement has occurred in the presence of the sign, of the, of the booths in the restaurant, whatever that might be. Similarly, the, the, uh, an S delta or a descriptive stimulus for, for uh, or an SDP, a descriptive stimulus for punishment, might be a restaurant that you got food poisoning at. Right? Does anybody have like a restaurant that they won't eat at because they got sick at or they had a really bad experience, right? Like you drive by, like that place is an SDP. That's an S Delta or SDP. That's a, that's a discriminative stimulus for punishment. You want to avoid that. You don't want to go anywhere near that because it signals that punishment is available. And that's due to history. Burger King. Yeah, there you go. Those late nights, right? <laughs> You're like, I got, I had a few too many beers, too much whiskey. And I had Burger King one time and that was it, right? So that's, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and there you go. Sometimes that happens, right? So you probably won't, so even Penny, the smell of curry, right? Or like specific spices that were related to that food are probably enough to abate any food eating response in that moment, <laughs> right? You're not gonna eat anything that signals that punishment is available. That signals that a hospital trip is available because there's a history of punishment there, right? And that's just a bad circumstance. That's just a, a, a bad situation, but that's how discriminative stimuli get shaped up is those histories of learning. So when we talk about discriminative stimuli, there are four general types. Yeah, don't blame Indian food, blame, it's a moment, it's momentary. <laughs> However, contingencies are powerful, right? We get stuck in that spot, we're like, ooh, that's rough. So there are four general types. There's SDs, S deltas, SDPs, S delta Ps. And I included this little key here, right? So you've got SDs evoke behavior, S deltas abate behavior, SDPs abate behavior, and S delta Ps evoke behavior. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. Each of these signal a different thing. SDs signal that reinforcement's available. S deltas signal that reinforcement's not available, signals extinction. SDPs signal that punishment is available, and S delta Ps signal that punishment is not available. And so we're going to get into that in just a minute. But yeah, S delta P is, is a thing that exists, right? It's the opposite. I mean, if, if, if there is a signal for punishment, there has to be an opposite. It's not as widely studied, but it does exist. Uh, I don't think it's on the task list, so don't stress out too much about that if that's a new term for you. <laughs> so let's go ahead and start with SDs. SDs. Um, if mom punishes and dad does it, but we're going to get into that. Mom would be an SDP and dad might be an S delta or an SD, right? Or my, or the combination of the two might be an S delta P because dad being there is going to signal that punishment is not available. Even though dad historically signals reinforcement, mom signals punishment. Them together as a conditional discrimination. We'll get into that because we're going to talk about that tonight too. I told you, I got a lot of stuff to cover. So heads up. <laughs> uh, SDs, they signal that reinforcement is available and it evokes behavior. So what ends up happening is, if I see something that I want, I'm going to engage in behavior to get it, right? So when you pull up to a restaurant, you see that open sign is lit up at your favorite restaurant, you walk in. Now, the important designation here is that it doesn't matter if you're hungry or not. It's signaling that it's available. We're not talking about relative value. We're talking about availability. The restaurant's open. You can walk into the restaurant and get food. When you walk into your kitchen, if you have a bowl full of fruit, 
whether you just ate lunch. Yeah, MO does not matter when you talk about SDs right now, okay? That's exactly it. When I walk into a restaurant, or when I walk into my kitchen and I see a bowl full of apples, and I'm like, oh, Honeycrisp apples are my favorite. And I see it's full. Even though I just ate lunch, I can see that they're available. So seeing a bowl full of apples is an SD. They're available whether I'm hungry or not, whether I'm satiated or deprived, right? So that's when we start talking about SDs. It's availability, right? So when you drive by a gas station and the gas station is on, okay? All that means is that gas is available. Your gas tank could be full or empty. It doesn't matter. It's talking about that gas station being lit up means that it's available, okay? So as you look at SDs, that's what they signal. They signal availability, whether you want it or not, okay? Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you have a history of reinforcement with it, for sure. But that's all it is, a signal. Whether, you know, whether, no matter what your learning history is, at that moment, like, it's talking about a signal. Like, what, at this point in time, it's just that it's available whether you want it or not, right? Now, S-deltas are the other side of that coin. You can't have an SD without an S-delta. For the condition to be on, there has to be a condition that's off. Okay, so an S delta means that it signals that reinforcement is unavailable and it's a signal for extinction. You're not going to get attention for a certain type of behavior in the presence of a teacher, right? Or certain, when the principal shows up, you don't engage in problem behavior, right? But there's, there's a different reason, right? It might be punishment or it might be that there's no reinforcement available. But what ends up happening is um, the S delta abates behavior. You're not going to continue to engage in behavior where there's no reinforcement available or when reinforcement is unavailable. Uh, kind of like going to a bar, even though you don't want a drink, getting a drink from the bar is available. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe I'm not thirsty, right? I'm not thirsty at all, but I see the bartender. The bartender means that drinks are available, whether I want them or not, right? And that's how, that's how SDs work. Now, here's the other side of that coin. Remember, we talked about SDs mean that the restaurant's open, but an S delta would be you go to your favorite restaurant, the sign says closed, you don't walk into the restaurant. What ends up happening is the closed sign means that there's no reinforcers available at that moment, right? It might be in the morning, it might be a different time, but right there in that moment, it's an S delta. It signals that you cannot get, you cannot walk into that restaurant and order food and get food. Okay. It is unavailable. So that close sign is going to signal that no reinforcement is available. And what's going to happen is it's going to abate your walking in behavior. You're not going to walk in because there's no reinforcement. It's going to suppress that behavior. So does everybody feel pretty comfortable with that so far? SDs, S deltas, and kind of what they signal? Okay. Cool. All right, good, good, good. As long as everybody's feeling good, because we're gonna get into the punishment stuff and that's always the fun stuff too. Cool. All right, so SDPs, okay? SDPs, they signal the punishment is, and I should say punishment is available. So I'll correct that before I send that out. Uh, punishment is available. And what ends up happening is it abates behavior. So if you see a police officer, how many of you slow down when you're driving and you see a police officer? Even if you're not speeding, you slow down just a little bit more than you normally would, right? Because they signal what? They signal that a ticket is, is available for speeding. So what ends up happening is you see the police officer, history of punishment, right? You lose money, it abates your speeding behavior. You stop speeding. So that's what happens with SDPs. There's signals of punishment are available. So you, engage, you don't engage in behavior that produce that punisher. And that's what SDPs do. When you see Burger King, that's an SDP, right? That's gonna abate your Burger King eating behavior, right? So when you, when you smell Indian food, that's an SDP that signals that, that punishment is available for that, okay? Uh, and that's just due to learning history, okay? So, S delta P's on the other side of that is that, uh, it never went back again, exactly. Um, well, so, so that might be a different thing. If you're in the left lane and you see that, then that's gonna evoke behavior, right? Cause you're gonna have to turn over. Like you're gonna have to cross that lane to get over there. So that's gonna be more like, um, uh, that would probably be like an SD that you see your exits over there that signals that availability is there. So what ends up happening is you, it, it signals the availability is there. You, it evokes that dangerous driving behavior and you cross all those lanes. So that's probably more like an S, SD than an SDP because it doesn't abate behavior, right? Um, if you stay in that left lane, well, I mean, is it, well, if you were in the left lane, whether you needed to get off on that exit or not, would it be valuable? The exit is going to signal that it's available, not necessarily that it's valuable. Maybe that if when you see like, maybe like the time, like your timing, right? Like maybe you see the clock and like you're running late, then that might be your EO, right? Because you don't want to be any more late than you already are, right? So, so seeing the sign is going to be more like an SD. It's going to say that, hey, my exit's there, whether I want it or not. Because when you drive down there later, right? When you drive by there later, or if you see an emergency vehicle coming, okay? So if you see an emergency vehicle coming, that's a signal to, well, that, that's, that's a different type of signal, but that's gonna evoke you moving out of the way, right? 
So, um, but that's going to make moving out of the way more valuable too. That's going to make getting out of the way more valuable. So there's a couple different things to look at there. Okay. Yeah. So when you look at S delta P's, okay, the other side of that, this is punishment is unavailable. And this is like a, a, a signal for a recovery from punishment. And what that means is that it evokes behavior, behavior that used to previously get punished will no longer get punished. And so what that happens is here is something like this, the corner where you usually see the police officer parked that you're driving, right? You see the police, the car, it's empty. So that means the, the cop is not there. That means punishment's not there. So you speed up because you're not going to get punished. The punishment is absent, right? So the absence of punishment will increase or evoke behavior in that moment. Remember, it's momentary. It's not like long-term, okay? But it's going to be that momentary thing where it's like in that moment, in that circumstance, that punishment is being withheld. So you go ahead and drive, okay? So this would be the same thing like, say you're working in an office and, um, and you see that your, uh, that your boss is locked away in their office, their blinds are closed and they're not walking around, right? Even though like historically your boss has walked around and maybe reprimanded you in front of people. When the, when the door is closed, the blinds are down and the, and the lights are off, that's an S delta P. The boss is not available to punish you, right? So behavior that would normally get punished like playing among us or, um, or being on Instagram or any of those things, those things would be evoked. They would increase in that moment, okay? Anybody had that boss that you were like, you were on, you were on it, right? You were like, I'm not going to mess up in front of this boss because they're going to yell at me, right? But when they weren't there, you kind of slacked off a little bit. The absence of your boss is going to be an S delta P. Um, so mom usually punishes the response, but the mom is gone. And then the response occurs uh, equal or more. It might, with S delta P, the response will occur more. Yeah, absolutely. It'll increase. So like, so if I'm walking to my house or I'm pulling up to my house and let's say like, let's say I'm a 16 year old driver, I pull up to the house. And mom is usually the one that punishes me. And usually when I see her car, that means that mom, yeah, yeah, more than baseline. It will return back to baseline or it would be, it would just, it would start increasing momentarily. That's really, it's, it's less about baseline and like long-term. It's more like in that moment. Um, but yeah, you might see that. So like when mom, if mom is the one that punishes me, that's an SD, right? Her car or an SDP, I'm sorry, SDP. Mom's van in the, in the driveway is going to signal that punishment is available. Mom, the empty driveway is an S delta P. That means that no punishment is available. So that's when I get in all the trouble. That's when I have the party, right? The, the parents are out of town, right? So that's when I started, that's when my party behavior is evoked. So that's when we look at SDs and SD. They're the same, they're the same side, or the different sides of the same coin. S DPs, S delta Ps, SDs, and S deltas. They, and all they do is they signal that a consequence is available, okay? Does that make sense so far? Everybody feel pretty good about that? Okay, cool. So the absence or, or like a, it's a stimulus change, right? So like Aubrey, so in that situation, the absence of a stimulus, which would signal that punishment is available, is still a stimulus change, right? And an empty driveway is still an, a stimulus change when you pull onto that, onto that street, right? Like if I pull into my, into my neighborhood and I see down the road that the, the driveway is empty, that's still a stimulus change in my environment. Because remember, a van or a car or an item is not a stimulus, right? Producing it is a stimulus change. Okay. Yeah. So seeing that's going to be a stimulus change and that stimulus change is going to be the thing that is going to evoke or evade your behavior. Okay. All right. So I see some people roll like kind of thinking, I saw a couple of people are like, Oh, what does that mean? So, so a stimulus is not a thing. A stimulus is a, a, a an energy change or a, a stimulus change is some kind of change in the environment. Right? Like, so, so me holding up a pen, like the pen is not the stimulus. Me producing the pen so you can see it, that's the stimulus change. That's the change in your environmental context that evokes or abates behavior, okay? I know that's very nitpicky, but that's important when you start talking about these because an S delta P could be the, the absence of a punishing stimulus. And then you end up in a situation where now it's an S delta P because the van's not there. All right, so, so a couple notes on discriminative stimuli, just to kind of reiterate this. Uh, for, for there to be an availability condition, there has to be an unavailability condition. So there has to be the, 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 the signal that nothing is, that there is not a, a, a consequence available. Okay. So an open restaurant cannot signal that food is available without having that closed restaurant condition. There has to be both. So when you start thinking about it and you start kind of parsing out whether or not it's an SD or an MO, ask yourself the question, is there a condition where reinforcement or punishment is not available that's similar to this? Like if reinforcement's available in this condition, what does it look like when it's not available? And that's gonna help you kind of tell whether or not it's value or it's availability. So uh, with regards to the car on the driveway, stimulus change would be me arriving and seeing the car. Yeah, it would be the site of the, the it would be the site of the driveway, the empty driveway. 
Um, and no, the, the MO doesn't always have to come before the SD. They, they, they usually happen pretty close together or they're pretty simultaneous. They don't have to happen. Uh, they're not like, you know, when you get into Jack Michael stuff, um, there's a lot of debate about MOs in general, about them being conceptually systematic, right? Because they're, um, they're not clear. You can't observe it or measure it. Uh, yeah, and referring to the, the, the four-term contingency, going back to that, they usually happen together, right? Um, you know, deprivation, satiation, those things serve as EOs or MOs. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you could do that, right? Like, have you ever done that? Have you ever gone to the grocery store and be like, oh, there's, there's these chips. I love these. I, for, I forgot uh, these existed. Now I really want these, right? Because maybe you've been deprived for it. So you don't realize you're deprived until you see that stimulus change. So there's, yeah. Yeah. So that can happen or it can happen like, oh my God, I'm really craving chocolate chip cookies. If I could have some right now. Yeah, exactly. You're hungry right now. That is an EO, right? And that's going to make food far more reinforcing. So the minute that you see like that bag of Doritos or like an, or whatever you like to eat, the minute that you see that, that's going to be like, there we go. I got it. That's going to be my SD. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like the more I talk about like that, that, that the Doritos logo, right? Yeah, absolutely. The Doritos logo becomes a CMOS, right? Because it's paired with Doritos. So um, that's why we like, that's why we crave Christmas cookies when we hear um, all I want for Christmas is you by Mariah Carey. Right. Like when you hear that song, you're like, Oh, I need cookies now. Right. That's a CMOS. That song gets paired with good stuff. So so when you start talking about discriminant stimuli, there has to be a, a, the opposite condition. There has to be a, an availability and unavailability condition for it to exist. Um, and, and again, we're talking about whether you want it or not. It's there whether you want it or not, okay? Yeah. So let's get into MOs. Let's focus on that for a minute, okay? So we're going to shift gears. Now we know all about availability and signals for availability. Motivating operations are referred to drive unofficially. You'll hear that like, what am, I, what am I motivated for? What do I want? What do I need? What do I crave, right? Cravings, you'll hear that, like cravings is one. Um, but it's a type of antecedent that actually increases or decreases the effectiveness of the consequence. So we hear value a lot, value altering effect, right? Value altering effect is not a great term for it. It should really be effectiveness altering effect. But I think that seemed to be a little bit redundant, right? Because value just, relative value just means it's more or less effective in that moment. So what I mean by that is, if I'm talking about establishing operations, if I'm talking about EOs, yeah, yeah, they could be, absolutely. They could be a hypothetical construct, right? Um, now, I'm not going to stress y'all out, but I kind of went over the four-term contingency. If you go look at, um, oh God, what's his name? I think it's, I think it's, um, Oh, it begins with a K. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Uh, but there is a 12-term contingency that explains all kinds of other things. But don't worry about that right now. Get through the exam and then, and then do all that work later, okay? Um, yeah, there's a 12-term contingency. It talks about, like, a lot of different things. It's really cool. Uh, if you ever get a chance to um, look at uh, – it's Cantor. Uh, K-A-N-T-O-R, if you look that up, um, he does interbehaviorism. And interbehaviorism talks about that. So, um, anyway. Not on the exam, not on your task list. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, Aubrey. Um, it's a whole thing. It's actually pretty straightforward, um, but it does provide a pretty in-depth way of looking at behavior. Yeah, it's really, really cool. It's definitely worth looking at. Um, so anyway, when you look at MOs, you've got establishing operations and abolishing operations. Establishing operations establish effectiveness. They make that thing more valuable. And abolishing operations uh, make it less valuable. And those MOs can actually evoke or abate behavior, right? Um, if a reinforcer is more valuable, then it's going to evoke behavior to get it. If a punisher is more valuable or if a punisher is more effective, it's going to abate responses that produce it. Because I don't want to contact an effective punisher, right? I don't want to be shocked. So kind of going back to the idea, value altering, function altering. Okay, value altering effects, they change the effectiveness of a consequence. They, they alter it. They, they, they make it so that consequence works better. Okay, or they make it work worse, right? So if, if, a, if a chocolate bar works better, then you're likely to engage in behavior to get it. If a chocolate bar works worse, then you're not likely to work to get it, right? So when you start thinking about reinforcers in, in value-altering effects, think about it as a, uh, the, the effectiveness. And this focuses on the stimulus or the stimulus change that we're talking about. This focuses on the, the consequence. Um, so function altering is specific to discriminative stimuli. Okay, so like think of it like this, a function altering effect would be something like uh, a hot donut sign at Krispy Kreme is just a hot donut sign at Krispy Kreme. It means nothing. It's neutral until it's paired with hot donuts. 
the hot donuts, the consequence of eating the hot donuts changes the, the hot donut sign from having a, a neutral effect to now having behavior altering effects. It changes the purpose of that sign. Now that sign signals something else, right? The first time you tried Indian food, the first time you tried Indian food was probably like, you had a pretty neutral experience with it, right? Okay. So at the first time you're like, oh, it smells good. And, you know, this, there's all these signals going on. And then you had that experience. And now that experience, that learning history had a function altering effect on Indian food. It changed what Indian food does to you. Yeah, it goes from neutral to learned. Exactly. So that's what a function altering effect looks like. Yeah. So, and it goes the other way, right? Like the first time you saw like a significant other, the first time you're like, okay. But then the longer you get to know them, now there's a function altering effect. Their, their, their features and their, their experience, like the experience you have with them changes what they signal, okay? So MOs don't have function altering effects per se, right? Like that comes with discriminative stimuli. MOs specifically talk about value altering and behavior altering effects. I, I'm so glad that, that you find those, those useful. I've, I've learned to steer away from like using the, the, the X example because somebody told me it was very traumatizing for them. I was like, good, okay, I'll avoid that. Like, so I, got, so I was like, Okay, well, we, we don't have to use X's at all anymore. So now behavior altering effects or dimension altering effects or repertoire altering effects, going back to that, you know, there's a change in dimension of the behavior. And when you talk about ev evocative or abative effects, they're focused on behavior specifically. Okay, and that's a really important point to make. Value altering focuses on the stimulus change, but behavior altering focuses on the behavior of interest. Okay, so if the question is asking about a stimulus or a consequence, it can't be behavior altering. Okay, it has to be value altering. And you'll see that when we get into some um, examples in a minute. Now, the, the, the challenge that I find to lower will be a stimulus for value altering. Yeah, uh, well, so it would be, would it be, it would be a stimulus for value altering of, let's see. Yeah, yeah, it would, right? So DeLorean would be like, yes, that's gonna establish that, 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 that time travel is really cool. So I'm gonna engage in time travel, right? Like that's a really interesting thing, right? Then I engage in time travel, which is a behavior altering effect, yeah. So yeah, the DeLorean establishes time travel as an effective consequence. <laughs> so I engage in my time traveling behavior. Yeah. And I go back to 1955 and I catch my dad peeping on my mom through the window because Back to the Future is a very strange movie if you've never watched it. So availability versus value. This is where people get hung up, I think, the most. Um, figuring out whether or not it's, I'm talking about it's, it's something that I can get or something that I want. Okay. And so this is the example that I try to use with this. Availability is the consequence that's likely to occur following a behavior, okay? That's what you have to ask. Is there a consequence likely to occur? And it's a signal that reinforcement can happen. Going back to the bowl of fruit, no matter if I'm hungry or not, if there's a bowl full of fruit, it's available. Now, if I've gone 10 hours without eating, then that fruit is gonna be way more effective, right? If I haven't eaten in days, then that fruit is gonna be a super effective reinforcer. It becomes more valuable in that moment. Now, if I just ate lunch, it becomes less valuable, okay? The bowl of fruit is still available whether I want it or not, but if I go without eating versus having just ate, that alters the, effect, the effectiveness of that fruit. That fruit is gonna, that effectiveness of that fruit or whatever that food is, is going to change depending on how satiated or deprived of food I am, okay? Does that make sense to everybody when I clarify it like that? Okay, availability is simply, it's there, value is, how much do I want it? How well is it gonna work? Okay, so we've got some ASRs because I don't, I don't just lecture. I've been staying up studying for two days straight. How many of you can relate to that right now? I think Lindsay can because she's about to sit for her exam. I've been up studying for two days straight. At hour 49, I look at my bed and I immediately lay down. Staying up for 48 hours served as what? Is that an EO or an SD? Go ahead and answer in the chat. Yeah, yeah, it's an EO, right? It, it signals, it makes it so that sleep is super reinforcing, rest, right? Deprivation from sleep, absolutely. So why is it, why couldn't we say this is an SD? Because the bed's always available, right? The bed's available whether you want to sleep or not, right? The other example I use is this, is because if you're studying in your room, the bed's always there, right? The bed would be the SD, absolutely. So uh, I think about it like this. 
if I'm a truck driver and I've been up for two days, and I'm tired, I'm sleep deprived. Sleep is incredibly valuable, right? Rest is valuable, but that doesn't mean it's available. Just because I want it and I desperately need it doesn't mean that I can get it. I can't get it while I'm driving, right? That's a different, that's gonna be a whole different issue. So that's, when I talk about EOs, like it becomes more valuable the less of it I get, no matter if it's available or not. Okay, the empty bed in this scenario, is that an EO or an SD? Yeah, it's an SD, right? It signals that sleep is available, whether you just woke up or you are about to go to sleep. It is always signals that reinforcement's available. It always signals that rest is available. All right, go work, everyone. Yeah, it's an, S it's a, it's an SD, absolutely. So this week has been really rough. Judy would not stop playing Nickelback songs all day, and I never caught up on any of my treatment plan updates. So after work, I go to the bar down the road, and I got a beer. Seeing the open bar served as what? Is that an EO or an SD? Yeah, it's absolutely an SD, right? The bar being open signals that I can get a drink whether I want it or not. Whether it was a rough week or a good week, doesn't matter. If I see the bar open, that means that I can get a reinforcer. All right, good work, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. So the stressful week served as what? What was the stressful week there? Yeah, see, y'all are getting it. See, it's not that crazy. <laughs> to everybody worries about EOs and SDs, I promise you it's not that crazy. All right, go work. Yeah, it's an EO, right? Specifically, it's an EO. Deprivation of relaxation, deprivation of sleep, right? Absolutely, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Deprivation of relaxation. That is, I feel like every behavior analyst in the world right now, uh, and RBTs too, absolutely. Anybody who's working in the field is like just tired. <laughs> yeah. All right, today in our team meeting, it's supposed to run for eight hours without a break, which is illegal for sure. And at the start of the meeting, I walk by the restroom, but don't need to use it. But at the end, I need to use it. I run out of the room to the restroom because I've been holding it too long. The long meeting served as what? What was the long meeting? Was it an EO or an SD? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's an EO. It's specifically an ego, EO for negative reinforcement, right? If I, yeah, an EO to go to the bathroom, it's definitely an, ego for, uh, an EO for negative reinforcement. I want relief, right? Like I've got a painful stimulus or an uncomfortable stimulus that I have to relieve, right? So that's what that long meeting does. Now seeing the bathroom after the meeting served is what? Yeah, good work, good work. Yeah, absolutely. Negative reinforcement is always a thing, right? We all like we all like relief, no matter what it is. It's super powerful. All right, good work. Yeah, this is going to be an SD, right? The bathroom door after the meeting serves as reinforcement, right? It signals that reinforcement's available. It signals that relief is avail available, right? That's why we look for bathrooms or restrooms when we're out and about, if we have to use them. Now, I go to the bathroom. I see that it's locked. The locked bathroom door served as what? What is the locked bathroom door? Yeah, it's an S delta, right? Yeah, it's an S delta because you can't get, there's no reinforcer available, right? You lose access to the reinforcer. There's no relief available. And that's when you find the janitor's closet or like a nice, you know, grouping of bushes outside that you can hide in. Yeah, key becomes a CMOT, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I don't care about keys until I need a key, <laughs> right? I, I, use that, I, I use that example for Ikea shelves. Anybody who's ever built an Ikea shelf, you know that little Allen wrench, right? Nobody cares about that Allen wrench until I need that Allen wrench to build an Ikea shelf. Otherwise, it goes in the trash, right? Yeah, yeah, peeing your pants could be an SDP. Well, yeah, peeing your pants could be an SDP. There's still relief, right? But that's gonna be a signal for punishment of social disapproval, right? Uh, no worries, Mara, no worries. I didn't see any of your answers, but I assume they're all correct because you all are a great group. All right, so going back to the idea of value altering effects, they establish or they abolish some consequence as effective, right? And so uh, and there's a momentary change in the value of a reinforcer or a punisher. So at certain points of time, some reinforcers are far more valuable. Sometimes punishers are far more effective. So like sweater weather in Florida, the colder that it gets in Florida, the more likely I'm gonna wear a hoodie or a sweater, right? Sweaters become incredibly valuable during the winter in Florida because you know what? No, I don't care what anybody says, Florida gets cold. Okay, people think that Florida doesn't get cold. It's, it gets to be like 50, 40 degrees here. That's cold in Florida, all right? So sorry it doesn't snow, but that's cold here, all right? But value-altering effects have these establishing and abolishing effects. 
Yeah. So there you go. I, I, you know what? I'm so glad I don't deal with ice um, that much, um, but it's only for my tea. So establishing operations. We look at it. Yeah. No, thanks. No, thanks, Lindsay. More power to you. Um, so establishing operations, motivating operations that increase the momentary effectiveness of a value or value of a reinforcing consequence, okay, or a punishing consequence. Okay, that's what I thought. I was like, you're not that far up. You're fine. Uh, South Carolina st still gets a little bit cold, though. It's weird. Now, um, when we talk about EOs, they establish the consequence will work, okay? So an EO for reinforcement means the reinforcer works better. An EO for punishment means the punisher works better. So what happens if a punisher works better? What happens to the behavior if a punisher works effectively? Is behavior evoked or abated? Yeah, behavior's abated, right? If a punisher works and it's more effective, an EO for punishment is going to abate behavior, right? It's gonna reduce behavior, absolutely. Now, abolishing operations, AOs, whether it's reinforcers or punishers, they decrease the momentary effectiveness or value of a consequence. What that means is they decrease that in a moment, they decrease that temporarily, okay? And if an, a reinforcer has no effectiveness, then, it's gonna, then the reinforcer isn't gonna work as well. You're not gonna engage in behavior to get that reinforcer. But if a punisher doesn't work that well, that means that behavior that used to be punished will return, okay? If you start getting used to punishers, if you start getting used to consequences like that, then the punisher no longer works as effectively. And what ends up happening is the behavior that used to get punished will increase. I have a teenage daughter. Punishers do not work. <laughs> I have to figure out other reinforcement strategies to, to, to work with her because um, for, for, for Celia, yeah, that's, oh, Tiger King's a whole thing. Lindsay, save it. Save it as a reward for when you pass your exam because it's a reward. Like, that's the real test. They should make you watch it and then analyze everybody's behavior for the exam because I feel like that is a real test of like an analyst's behavior. Like, like being able to analyze, because it is, it is something. It is something. So AOs, they decrease the effectiveness. Uh, Lindsay, I already started writing it. I, I'm almost done with it, actually. Like, I, I just have to, like, figure out, like, when to release it, because they're doing, like, a new one. I have, I have it's, uh, it's called uh, Tiger King, what, or what Tiger King taught me about behaviorism. Yeah, 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 it's good. So I got, I got you. So uh, now behavior altering effects. We kind of talked about this before, right? So it's a momentary change, right? So an umbrella at 3 p.m. in Florida during the summer is going to evoke my umbrella using behavior, right? At 3.15, the rain stops. That abates my behavior, my, my umbrella using behavior, right? So a behavior altering effects, we kind of covered this. I'm not going to harp on this too much, but evocative and abative effects. They increase or decrease behavior depending on the context. Now, think about this. I'm out in the desert and I've run out of water. How valuable is water if I'm out of water in the desert? How valuable are we talking here? Super valuable, right? That's an EO, That's it, it establishes water as an effective consequence. And what am I gonna do? If I'm that thirsty in the desert, what am I gonna do? What are some behaviors you might see evoked in that moment? Yeah, water seeking behavior. Like I might start digging, right? I might start running. I might start doing all kinds of stuff. I might start drinking my own sweat because that's all. That's just all I can do, right? You might start doing some sketchy stuff, right? Like you might start making some. You might wheel and deal a little bit, <laughs> right? Like that's when you get into like some seedy undergrounds, like the water, the water black market, right? But when I'm out in the desert, if I if I go a lot too long without water, water increases in value. And then what changes you see in the, in the behavior during that time? You see it, the behavior is evoked, right? Uh, you look for people who have it. Absolutely. And then Patrick, that's exactly it. What would you do for a Klondike bar? Please don't ask me. <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> right? So, but if I've just eaten lunch and my mom offers to take me out for ice cream, how valuable is ice cream when I'm full? Now for children, I don't know if you've learned this, but they have, a, 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 they have what's called a dessert stomach. So they might be full on dinner, but there's a dessert stomach that is all kinds of ready for ice cream, right? So when we talk about that, like, you know, for the most part, you know, not so much could be an AO for me, but an EO for others. Yeah, absolutely. Lindsay, and that, is, that points to individuality, right? Like the, the whole thing comes down to like individual MOs are different for every person, right? What signals availability and, and unavailability is different for every person. It's all based on learning history. So I'm so glad you illustrated that. Now, how likely am I to engage in ice cream getting behavior? Um, I think Aubrey is down. Uh, Penny is probably not so much down to do that. Uh, Shruti is definitely gonna, is like good for it, right? Like I, you know, depending on the person, like 
it, it's, it depends on whether that's an EO or an AO, right? And that's a really important designation to start making when you look at this. All right, so let's look at effects. Let's start identifying effects here. I have a major headache and loud noises make it worse. I try to go to a concert, which is against my better judgment. And as soon as I walk into a loud room, I reach for my earplugs. Hearing the loud noises increases the value of earplugs. What kind of effect is this? Okay, you got some A's? Yeah, good. Yeah, it's an establishing effect, right? It establishes earplugs as, and actually earplugs become a CMOT, right? Because earplugs signal that there's, there's relief on the way, right? They're, they're a means to an end, right? But it's, a, it's an EO, right? It signals that, that it, it, makes, it makes reducing the noise more valuable. It makes getting earplugs more valuable. So all of those things increase in value in that moment. Now, hearing the loud noises makes me reach for my earplugs. What kind of effect is that? Got one C. If I'm reaching for my earplugs, if I so if I'm there, you go. I was gonna say like if I'm reaching for my earplugs, I see a momentary increase in my behavior, right? So momentary increases are evocative effects, right? So I, if I'm gonna, I, I'm not nor I'm not reaching for my earplugs that moment, but then I reach for my earplugs. Oh, and then I got it, right? So it works out. Okay. Putting the earplugs in my ears also stops me from plugging my ears. What kind of effect is this? So I put the earplugs in my ears. I am not putting my fingers in my ears. What kind of effect is that? <laughs> Lizzie, that's, that's, I, I have an instructional design minor, so <laughs> it's, I, I can't help it. Yeah. So a beta effect, right? So if I, if I stop putting my fingers in my ears, then that's an abative effect. That's a temporary reduction in my behavior, right? So I went from, from like having to plug my ears. Now I've got some other way to do that. So I'm not plugging my ears anymore. Good work. All right. The reduction of noise decreases the value of earplugs. Yeah. Good work, everyone. Good work. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, it's going to be an abolishing effect, right? It decreases, it decreases the value of it. I don't need that anymore. I don't want that. I don't want that anymore. All right. Yeah, exactly. It's stimulus change, right? Absolutely. All right. So Florida is hot and it's so hot that swimming is a common activity here. And during the summer, the heat is so intense that I will find the closest pool to swim in. Heat during the summer increases my pool seeking behavior. What are we talking about here? increases my pool seeking behavior. Yeah, absolutely. Remember, yeah, absolutely. It evokes, it's a, an evocative effect, right? It evokes my pool, my pool swim seeking behavior. Like I see an increase. So it's, so it's, well, the heat is going to increase my pool seeking behavior. That's what I'm talking about, right? The heat, the heat is going to be an EO, right? The heat makes cooling down more valuable, but I'm not talking about stimulus in here. I'm talking specifically about my pool seeking behavior. So that's when you get into these questions, that's what you've got to like when you, yeah, it's evoking a response. Exactly. So like on, on the exam, when you take it, like those are things to look for. It's like, am I talking about the behavior the stimulus? What am I talking about here? What, what's, is, am I talking about an increase in value and increase in behavior? What am I looking at here when these questions come up? Heat definitely serves an EO, right? The hotter I get, the more valuable cooling down becomes. Absolutely. So you're right on that. So heat during the summer increases the value of swimming pools. Swimming pools become more valuable. What kind of effect is that? Yeah. Absolutely, right? Swimming pools become a really valuable stimulus in that moment, right? Stimulus change. Absolutely, because it's talking about stimulus. Swimming pools are not behavior. Swimming pools are stimulus changes, right? If you're looking for swimming pools, right? Or just so in that, yeah, exactly. Well, if I'm looking for swimming pools, then it's evoked. If the swimming pools become more valuable, then that's established, right? Absolutely. All right, good work, good work, cool. All right, after I swim, I cool down, right? And the pool isn't quite as valuable. What kind of effect is that? What are we talking about here? After I cool down, the pool isn't as valuable. Yeah, good work, everyone. Good work, folks. Yeah. 
it's going to be an abolishing effect, right? It decreases in value, it decreases in that momentary. Uh, it, it's still talking about the pool, exactly, but it's still, it's also like it just becomes less valuable the more I swim, right? Yeah, you all have done that. You've gone swimming and been like, I don't need to do this anymore. I'm done. Like the pool isn't going to be like you're satiated on it. Absolutely. All right, cooling down decreases my swimming behavior. What kind of effect is that? Cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's a beta effect, right? It, like it decreases my, it's a momentary decrease. It doesn't mean I'm not going to swim ever again. What that means is that I'm just going to stop swimming right now. Yeah, exactly. There you go, Lindsay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good work. Cool. So when we talk about MOs, and this is where I'll wrap up tonight, and then we'll leave some time for questions. There are four general types of MOs, right? There are, you know, we talked about those four general types of SDs, right? You've got SDs, S deltas, SDPs, S delta Ps. And there are also four types of MOs, general types. You got EOs for reinforcement, AOs for reinforcement, EOs for punishment, and AOs for punishment. Okay, it's important to know the difference of what they all do because they all do different things. Now, EOs for reinforcement, they increase the value of a reinforcer and they evoke behavior. So when Shaggy spends some time in the mystery machine, food becomes more valuable. And he may visit multiple convenience stores at, or local restaurants to get this food, right? So the more valuable food becomes, it evokes food seeking behavior. And that's an EO for reinforcement. So an increase in value, increase in behavior, right? Pretty straightforward. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, cool. All right. Then the convenience stores, what are the convenience stores in this? Shaggy. Yeah, I'm Shaggy from uh, Scooby-Doo. Okay, so, so it's an old 70s cartoon in the United States, and the, the end joke is that they're very stonery. Like, they love, like, they're, like, always high. Um, that's the joke. And so they get the munchies. Like, they have the mystery machine, and they're always craving food, and they talk like hippies. It's like a whole thing. So, yeah, so <laughs> the SD is not only Scooby-Doo, <laughs> but it's – it's also the convenience store, right? Uh, yeah, Penny, it's worth it. It's worth looking at because it's, it's just so bizarre that it existed for a little bit. Yeah, so the convenience stores, the local restaurants, yeah, you, you blasted teens. And, you're, and I would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for you meddling kids, right? So the restaurants become SDs, right? They signal that reinforcement's available. The convenience stores become SDs. They were high. Oh, they were very high. Go watch it again and tell me they weren't. They were afraid of anything that moved. They were, eat, they were always looking for food. They were super paranoid, super hungry. I don't know what that would be other than high. And they even make jokes in the movie. Yeah, they do make jokes in the movie where like uh, they climb, they're, they're barbecuing in the, in the van, but it looks like the van is like pouring smoke out like they're smoking in the van. It's just, and they're just barbecuing in it. So... EOs for reinforcement, they increase the value of a reinforcer, they increase behavior, right? So establish a reinforcer, evoke a response. AOs for reinforcement, they decrease or abolish the value of a reinforcer and they abate behavior that produced it. So what ends up happening is, is it starts to get darker outside, the sun goes down. Um, <laughs> there you go, oh, yes, oh good, okay, I'm so glad, I'm so glad. Um, so it gets dark outside, so I take my sunglasses off, I don't need them anymore. As it gets darker, I need my sunglasses less and less and less. And so sunglasses become less valuable the darker it gets, unless you're Corey Hart, who wears his sunglasses at night. Everybody else finds that sunglasses at night are not valuable, okay? So as that decreases, right, as, the, as that is decreased in value, my sunglass seeking behavior is abated. I'm not going to go looking for sunglasses. I'm not going to put sunglasses on. So it becomes less reinforcing. So that's an AO for reinforcement, okay? It does establish my coolness. I'll take, I'll take that, right? It establishes my, 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 hip, my hipness in that moment. But, uh, in, but in this moment, right? Like I don't need it as much because I don't need relief as much, right? So it decreases in value, it decreases behavior, and that's an AO for reinforcement. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, everybody can agree on that, cool. Okay, I only got two more, I promise. I know I'm hitting you with a lot of stuff, so don't worry. Now, EOs for punishment. They increase the value of a punisher, which decreases behavior. So they do the opposite of an EO for reinforcement. It increases the value of a punisher and decreases behavior. This means the punisher works better. So if I have less money in my bank account, I have $10 in my bank account, I'm not going to speed. I'm going to avoid my speeding behavior because I cannot afford to get a speeding ticket. Okay. That makes that, that getting a speeding ticket so much more powerful when I have less money in my bank account. Right. 
So that's how EOs for punishment work. If the, if the, the less money I have, the more, uh, the more likely I'm going to avoid any, anything to get me in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, Danielle. I'm so glad. Um, so think about that for a second. EOs for punishment. Okay. If a punisher works better, I'm not going to engage in behavior to contact it. I'm going to avoid behavior to contact it. Any behavior that produces the punisher will be suppressed or decreased. Okay. All right. Does that make sense to everybody when I say that? Okay. The last one's an easy example. I promise. AOs for punishment. AOs for punishment, they decrease or abolish the, fact, the effectiveness of a punisher. That means the punisher doesn't work as well. So what ends up happening is the behavior is evoked. Okay. So how many of you have done something stupid when you were drunk? Nobody wants to admit it. That's okay. You don't have to. Okay. I know this is recorded. So don't admit it if you don't want to. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Patrick. I appreciate you, you breaking the ice on that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hey, listen, I don't judge. I don't judge. I've done, done, I've done things like that too. So I'm just, I get it. So, but why would we do that? That's something that we wouldn't normally do in a normal situation. If I was at FABA, if I was at the conference, I wouldn't go poop in a barbecue, right? Because what ends up happening is the more that I drink, it decreases social disapproval right? So if I go to a bar and I have a few whiskey drinks, maybe even a vodka drink, I might start to do karaoke. I will never sing in front of, in, in front of people sober, right? But the more that I drink, the less valuable or the less effective punishers become, social punishers become. So it's going to evoke behavior that would normally produce social punishers, right? And so I got to edit this too, because that's not, that's not quite correct. So I'll, I'll, I know it's kind of says something funny, but uh, it evokes behaviors that, that used to uh, be suppressed by punishers. So like if, I, if I'm drunk, I'm not thinking about what people care about, right? So I'm going to do dumb things. Like that's why you watch videos of people fighting cops when they're drunk, right? Like on a normal day, they would not throw a punch at a cop. But if they've had a couple too many, all of a sudden it seems like a good idea. And those punishers that go along with assaulting an officer become less and less valuable. They work less. And that's why people who are drunk tend to be a little bit more belligerent. They do dumb things when they're drunk. So that's how AOs for punishment work. The, the punisher, the value or the effectiveness decreases and behavior increases, okay? I don't recommend imitating that either. Don't cop a charge, especially before you sit for your boards because that can be a disqualifying thing. So don't do that. Don't end up in prison before you sit for your exam. So essentially what it comes down to is this. EOS for reinforcement, make a reinforcer better. It evokes behavior that produces it. AOS for reinforcement, make a reinforcer work less and abates behavior that produces it. EOs for punishment make a punisher work better and abates behavior that produces it. And AOs for punishment make a punisher work less and evokes behavior that produces it. Okay. So that's kind of what happens here. That's what we see here with these different types of EOs and AOs. Now in sum, and this is where I'll wrap up and we can leave some time for questions. In sum, discriminative stimuli, they signal that consequences available or unavailable, whether you want it or not. Okay. The idea is, I'm so glad to hear that, Penny. I appreciate that. Uh, it, it's, it's available whether you want it or not. It is not about value. It is about whether it is there. Okay. MOs, make the consequence more or less effective, whether it's available or not. I can go without, I can be in, in the desert where there is no water. And the longer I go without water, the more valuable water becomes. So it is not about availability. It is about whether or not I want it. Okay. Value altering effects. Talk about establishing and abolishing effects. Behavior altering, it talks about evocative and abative effects, okay? And that is the, those are the biggest takeaways from today. Making sure that you know those things about the stuff that we talked about so that when you study, you can start discriminating what makes the most sense for, for what you're trying to answer. So that's all I got for content, if that's okay with everybody. Does anybody have any questions? Does anybody, how's that? Yeah, of course, Aubrey, that's what I, that's, I'm glad to help. Shane, thanks so much. This was really awesome. Yeah, it was of really, course. really cool. I would love to hear more about function and altering effects, but because then now in my mind, I just I will think of Indian food forever. But um, so <laughs> <laughs> sorry, okay. No, you're um, good. So it changes the function of a stimulus, as in prior to. Um, it was just a stimulus and now it's become either a reinforcer or a punisher. Is that the, um, the, val uh, the function altering effect? Yeah, it changes, okay. it changes, yeah, it changes what it signals, right? Like, like when you're younger, like, uh, 
Let's look at the little Albert experiment. Are you familiar with the little Albert experiment? With the bunnies? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when little Albert was introduced to the bunnies, the bunnies were neutral, right? Right. And they were actually probably pretty reinforcing. And then when that loud noise came and all the punishers came along with that, it changed the function of the bunny. The bunny did something different now. The bunny used to be fluffy and kind and great, and right. now it's not. So that's a function altering effect. And that's an extreme example. But when you think about that, like that changed what the purpose of the bunny was. Right? Uh, so it's basically when you turn a neutral stimulus into a conditioned punisher or reinforcer. That's the function yeah. altering effect. Yeah, or something cool. that used to be a punisher could become a reinforcer, right? Something right. that used to be I punishing could be, yeah. So it could be any any of those changes. When you're changing the purpose or the meaning of that stimulus, that's exactly what that is. Yep. So if I visit fruity and the Indian food's okay, that would be a function altering effect. Yeah. So like, what you probably need to go through is like maybe some uh, like respondent conditioning related to Indian food, and we'll work on that, and then we'll change that previously aversive stimulus so that 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 condition stimulus that evokes a certain behavior uh into uh condition stimulus that evokes salivation instead right but it's um it's operant conditioning right that's the function altering effect no function altering effects happen with uh respondent conditioning as well oh with both yeah so whenever you alter the the neutral stimulus i got it okay thanks yeah. so much yeah of course of course all right any other questions? I see we've made a date for Indian food, so that's nice. Yeah, Shane, I, I too, I really love your energy. It was just so cool and um, your entire presentation. Are you gonna give more? We, we want more of this. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to whenever and whenever. Like, I, I mean, I have to plan it out a little bit, but I'm happy to help, happy to help you know? And, and I, I'm, there are some topics that I'm not very great at. Um, so it just depends on the topics that you wanna talk about. Like. Uh, I try not to talk about ethics too much because ethics becomes like this big thing. Like I get a lot of grief about the way that I approach ethics because I uh, approach them like functional, like a functional contextual approach. So like, it's like, um, this is what the code says. Yeah. The well, code, context this, this matters, the code says, right? Look, context matters. Absolutely. So I'll go, this is what the code says, but don't do that. Do this. And, and the board's like, what are you doing? Ah, like they get mad at me about that. So, um, yeah, well, it thanks, depends. Lizzie. I say it all the time. It depends. So Lizzie, we really appreciate you setting this up. And also, uh, Shane. Yeah, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is amazing. Um, we're going to have a lot of people asking for the recording. <laughs> cool. And I'll make sure I'll, I'll revise the PowerPoint too. So you have it and you can send that out as like a slide deck as well. Um, so that people can use that as study materials and whatnot. Okay. Awesome. Patrick, do you have oh, any questions? I'm uh, sorry. You're, you're, you're amazing. I can't wait to see more of you. Your energy level is like amazing. Oh, thank uh, you. I've had a lot of coffee today. Um, I, I hear Priya. Priya, you you had a question? Yeah, first of all, I really, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I really love having food in my mouth. Anyway, I, I really want to thank you for this beautiful teaching. And you know what? The energy is very, very, like, amazing. And I, this concept was something I was always struggling with. And today, I literally understood. But thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. And That's my goal. One more thing. Yeah. Thank you. And one more thing, I'm just gonna uh, like, you know, as my, uh, a couple of other people asked as well, I was wondering when would be the next one if any possibilities with di different topics would be absolutely kind. If we, you can come up with it, that would be absolutely kind. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to figure out some stuff and, and work with y'all. And, uh, and you know, I have like a like an army of supervisees that I work with right now. Like I have like 10 or 12 supervisees that I work with. So like, <laughs> I would love to have them like come and help and like do some stuff with that too. So we have like, we can definitely make make that happen. So um, awesome. yeah, if you, have, if you have a specific topic, Priya, that you really want to focus on, like, let me know. And I'll see if that's something that I feel pretty comfortable enough to teach on. Um, Experimental designs, I, yeah, I can teach that. That's, <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Verbal behavior. So verbal behavior I can do. I can do experimental design. I can do CMOs. CMOs are pretty straight. I can do CMOs in five minutes. CMOS is, uh, I can do it, I'll do it right now real quick so you have it. CMOS, it's just a result of pairing, right? So why do you crave hot chocolate when it snows? It's not because it's cold. It's because you usually drink hot chocolate when it snows. So snowing and, and it, like you've got a, this pairing situation, right? Like why do you crave certain foods when you go to your grandma's house, right? You go to your grandma's house and then like you start craving, like the food is the, is the UMO, right? And it gets paired with your grandma's house. So anytime you see your grandma's house, you start salivating, you start craving her food, right? That, that, so that's all about CMOS. CMORs are signal that Can things ask, are going to get the, worse. ask something about that, that you were yeah. talking uh, with the CMOS? So to my knowledge, it's, 
is it always a UMO it's paired with? Because I always see the examples together with a UMO. So generally, yes. Um, okay. uh, there are. Yeah, <laughs> the, yeah Patrick, I, that's, I've heard that. It's a very strange thing, but I. But everybody's got their thing. Kansas is, a, is an odd place. Um, okay. Yeah, but so so Penny, yeah. I, uh, most of the time, uh, a conditioned motivating operation has to be paired with an unconditioned thing, but there might be some other factors there that you look at. So um, it's more important that you know that it's paired uh, than you know that it's like that specific. Like I tell people not, don't get in the weeds, like super in the weeds about CMOs. Like you don't need to know it so much that like you're an expert in it. You just need to know what it is and be able to identify it. Well, I'm just wondering with the CMO is whether it can be a CMO with a CMO. That's what I was yeah, most curious probably, about. There's probably some, I mean, I'm sure there's some examples of that um, that are out there, I would imagine. So, um, so CMORs are signals that things are going to get worse. So like when your alarm clock goes off, that signals that you are about to lose uh, rest, right? When you see your uh, ex's car in the parking lot at Publix, you're probably not going to go there, right? So it's a signal things are going to get worse. And so what you do is you engage, yeah, a worse thing or improving, Lindsay, yeah, I was going to say. So the other side is a, a promise CMOR, right? So when you, walk into, uh, when you walk into a restaurant and you see your date, you're like, tonight's going to get good. Right, so that's a CMOS or CMOR. That's a signal. That's a promise signal, right? Um, or like when you're in school and you see that it's like three o'clock, right, and you're about to get out of class. Like that's a CMO, a CMOR, a promise type. Um, and so there are signals that get worse. Signals are going to get better. Um, yeah, after after twelve drinks, it's the last call. That could be a CMOR, right? If you want another drink, but it could be a CMOS, meaning that you're going to get yourself out of trouble. Or a CMO, I'm sorry, a CMOR promise type. And so I keep, I keep saying that. A CMOR so, promise type that you're going to get out of that situation so you don't do something dumb. So Shane, can I ask a question? Yeah. So with regards to the, the car, so um, my, uh, the, my husband's car signals that um, the situation is improving. So it could, that could be CMOR. Yeah. But um, it's also the car has always been paired with the presence of my husband. And that's when I go down the rabbit hole when I think it's CMOR, no, it's a CMOS. Don't, don't overthink it. So think about what the, what the effect is. Like, what's the value there? Like, what does it mean? It's not because you're, you start like craving your husband's attention when you see his car. Like you just know that things are going to get better, right? Like you say, like it's a signal that things are going to get better for you in that moment. So like, try not to, try not to get too in the weeds with it. Like, and, and what I can do is like, when we get into like a CMOR presentation, I can get really specific with that stuff. Uh, I have no problem doing that if you want to. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far just yet. Just, I would say like, when I see this thing, it's, it's signal, cause everything, it's all pairing. It's all conditioned. A CMOT, a CMOR, a CMOS, like all that's, con it's all conditioning, right? Uh, it's due mm -hmm. to learning history. It's due to some kind of pairing and some consequences. Um, yeah, so it, and a lot of people do that, Trudy. Like a lot of people overthink. Like I try to say, keep it simple. Like, so what does it mean when you see your husband's car? That means that your condition is about to improve, right? That means that there's about to be a whole lot of reinforcers. That means there's about to be minimal punishers. Like that's what that is really the signal for. And then it's due to learning history, right? Like you've been reinforced in the presence of the car. You've been reinforced in the presence of the husband. And that's kind of what, um, what's going on. Um, okay, yeah, respondent extinction. Well, let me get into CMOTs real quick, and then I'll give an example of respondent and operant extinction. Um, CMOTs, the terminal re reinforcer can only be met through some kind of other reinforcer. So when you have to go to the grocery store, how do you get to the grocery store? You drive, right? If most people drive, I would say. So if you're driving, what do you need to drive? You need your car keys. So car keys become super reinforcing because it's a means to an end. Tools become a means to an end when you're building something, right? The, the car keys are not the terminal reinforcer. It is not the thing that you want. What you want is to go grocery shopping and get all your food, right? But the car keys become reinforcing. And so you engage in behavior to contact car keys so that you can get going. Well, and, and you don't even need to go that far, Shruti. You don't even, don't even go that far. That's, that's, your, that's where you start overthinking it. What, because here's, because it's a sequence, right? Like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a behavior chain. So I find my car keys. So now I have my car keys, right? My car keys are an antecedent for what? It's going to evoke my car driving behavior. So I go to the car and I engage in all this behavior to drive. My car starts, I start driving. I get to the grocery store, the side of the grocery store. It's like, it becomes this larger behavior chain. So, um, so, but yeah, I mean, we can do, 
I can do all kinds of talks on that um, and have fun with that. And then the last one, respondent extinction and operant extinction. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. That's where, that's exactly where it comes in. So um, respondent extinction. Respondent extinction means that you unpair stimuli with, and there's no consequence. All you're doing is you're presenting a stimulus that was previously conditioned and without the, the, the second stimuli. So when Pavlov was conditioning the dogs, it was meat powder metronome, meat powder metronome, meat powder metronome, right? Because it wasn't meat bell, meat bell, meat bell. Everybody thinks it's meat bell. Meat powder metronome, meat powder metronome. And exactly, Shruti, bell, no food, bell, no food, bell, no food, bell, no food, until the bell no longer elicits salivation. So the more that I produce the bell without being paired with the meat, the, 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 the salivation is going to occur less and less and less. That is respondent extinction. There's no consequence, right? It's bell, meat powder, bell, or I'm sorry, bell salivation, bell salivation, bell salivation, no consequence whatsoever. Operant extinction is that you withhold the consequence, okay? Have you ever like had somebody who was like, like, have you ever had an ex that would call and call and call and call and call and you stopped picking up their phone calls? That's operant extinction. They stopped calling you eventually, right? That's operant extinction. So what you're doing is you're withholding the reinforcer. Like you are preventing that reinforcer from occurring. And ultimately what happens is the behavior decreases as a result. Yeah, for sure, Penny. So we, so I, I'll make a note um, to see if I can get some resources on that because I am putting together some PowerPoints for some lectures on CMOs. So what I can do is I can kind of gather that information. And once that's all finalized, I can let Lindsay know and we can maybe do some stuff around that. If y'all are cool with that. Shen, can I ask you a quick question, please? Yeah. So in, in terms of CMOT, is that uh, event, is the CMOT or the behavior, is that the core key is the CMOT, the meaning going to the grocery store is a CMOT or, you know, uh, that particular core key is always available there on that particular moment, the core key becomes CMOT. So is that both CMOT, the event and the core key or just the core key then? Just the car key. So okay. just the car key. Yeah. The key is the CMOT because the CMOT leads to the, the, the final reinforcer, the thing that I want the most at the end. Okay. Got you. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, no problem. I look at I, the, the example I use for CMOTs too is flour when you're baking. Like nobody eats flour, but people eat chocolate chip cookies, right? So flour becomes a CMOT because it's a means to get those chocolate chip cookies, right? I don't care about flour until I need to make chocolate chip cookies. Right. Perfect. Now I understand very much because it's related cool. to the food. <laughs> yeah, that's you. it. I, I've learned to just tie it back to food and everybody will be good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Shane, yeah. can I ask a question? Yeah. What you just said about respondent versus uh, operant extinction, if I can summarize, then respondent condition is where you remove the stimulus prior to the response and operant um, extinction is where you remove the stimulus con uh, contingent upon the response. Yep, exactly. Okay. So cool. that's exactly it. So with with Thanks. with respondent extinction, you withhold the antecedent that that is paired. With operant extinction, you withhold the consequence that is produced by the response. Awesome. Thanks. That's that's that is the the the, the most succinct way I've ever heard, heard anybody put that. So I appreciate that. That's good. Cool. Does All anyone right. Anyone else have any questions? Cool. Okay. Well, thank you, Shane, so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. Sure I'll get a whole bunch of messages on what topics. To go <laughs> yeah, yeah. Throw me some. Throw me some stuff and what you find most important, and I'll see. I'll see what we can. Uh, what we can get together. Okay. Sounds great. All right, y'all. Cool. Have a great so night. Have All right. Y'all take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night. See ya. Bye.